pad out or use the book either one you want to do now you stay right with me the national debt just write that national debt the debt that we are in as a nation first of all Americans are like sheep they never ask themselves questions if we have a national debt of six trillion dollars it would be interesting to know who we owe Did you ever ask yourself that question? Well, the national debt. Well, what is it? Who do we owe? Where'd we get the money? What we borrow it for? What's the interest rate? Who are we paying back? We don't know. We just go on. Listen to this. The national debt in 1901 was one billion dollars. One. It stayed there until World War I and it went up 25 billion dollars after world war one a jump from 1 billion to 25 billion as a result of one war 1942 to 1952 it went from 25 billion to 72 no excuse me let me start over 1918 to 1941 on the eve of World War II, it had gone from 25 billion to 49 billion. 1942 to 52, it went from 72 billion to 265 billion. From 1962 to 1970, it went from 303 billion to 383 billion. From 1971 to 76, from 409 billion to 631 billion. From 1990, in 1990, from 76 to 90, it went from 631 billion to 2 trillion. You know that a trillion is a thousand billion. You understand that? I don't, I don't want to get these numbers so big to you that you don't understand. Let me break it down for you. In 1990, the national debt was 2 trillion dollars. As of today, you have to get it every day. As of today, it's six trillion from two trillion, six trillion seven hundred and ninety-five billion nine hundred and fifty-five million seventy-four thousand six hundred and ninety-nine dollars and ninety-nine cents. That's what we owe today. To whom? To whom do the citizens of the United States of America owe seven trillion dollars? Wait, it's growing. Are you ready? It's growing one billion six million dollars a day. How's it growing if we're not borrowing anymore? Thank you. But your Bible doesn't call it interest. Your Bible calls it usury. I dare you to touch somebody and say, you're using me. Oh, uh-huh. See, when that banker comes along and said, well, it's just thus and so interest, you ought to look right back at him and say, you're using me. See, you don't think you can get out. You're looking at me like it's a mocking dream. Here's what your Bible says, Exodus 22, 25. If you lend money to any of my people that are poor by thee, thou shalt not be to him as an usurer, neither shall thou lay upon him usury, neither shall you lay upon him interest. Leviticus 25, 36 and 37. Take thou no interest of him or increase, but fear thy God, that thy brother may live with thee, that thou shalt not give him the money by interest, nor lend him thy victuals for increase. Deuteronomy 23, 20. Unto a stranger thou mayest lend upon usury, but unto thy brother thou shalt not lend upon usury, that the Lord thy God may bless thee in all that thou settest thine hand unto, to the land whither thou goest to possess it. Here's what Thomas Jefferson said. If the American people ever allow private banks to control the issue of their money first by inflation 
then by deflation, the banks and corporations that will grow up around them, around the banks, will deprive the people of their property until their children wake up homeless on the continent their fathers conquered. Do you know right now, if we got together as the American people and we sold every building and every square inch of American soil for the total amount of its worth, we would have to pay back that America and two more. Somebody owns this nation. You drive in here all reared back in that car like you own it. Miss a payment and see who owns it. And see if they give you the interest back that you paid on the loan that you've been paying for five years. You think you own your house? Miss four payments and they'll stick a foreclosure sign out in front of you because the bank owns your house. I walked around my house yesterday. I said, thank you, Lord. Look at this driveway. Thank you, Lord. They can't take it from me. Thank you for my house. Thank you for my children's bedroom. They can't take it from me. Because I don't owe nobody nothing. The Bible says, owe oh, no man anything but to love him. Come on now, shout a little bit. There are three types of conquest. Number one, war. Captives hate and rise up against the aggressors and it takes too much force and money to maintain a situation where you have taken a nation captive by war. Secondly, religious conquest. But by nature, religion lacks military force to regain control once the captives are disillusioned. The third form is economic conquest. Place the people under tribute with no visible force, no marching army, no guns, no police, no secret, what was that secret thing that they had in Russia, the KGB, no KGB, no secret service, take them captive by requiring tribute of them, by requiring them to pay you interest. Here, here. Tribute is collected by legal debts and taxes. Therefore, those that are paying them believe they are paying for their own good and the good of others and to protect them from some unseen enemy. Now watch. The captors become the benefactors and the protectors. In other words, you're paying tribute for what you believe to be his protection. Does that sound like organized crime to you? But you never looked at interest that way. Why are you looking at me so funny? You want me to go on? Matthew 4.10 Worship the Lord your God, and him only shalt thou serve. Exodus 20 verse 3 Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Romans 13, 8, owe no man anything but to love him. The founding fathers in, the artic in Article 1 of the United States Constitution wrote, Congress alone shall have the power to coin and regulate money and the value thereof, because only Congress is subject to the vote of the people. Isn't this supposed to be government of the people? By the people? For the people? Do you know that man can create two things? He can create an immortal being. That's what you do when you have a baby. That baby's going to live forever somewhere. The second thing man can create is money. To create means to make something out of nothing. Now a lumberman makes lumber out of a tree. So he's not a creator. And then a builder takes those boards and he builds a house. But he's not a creator. At a factory, takes metal and glass and rubber and steel and plastic, and they manufacture an automobile. But they made that automobile out of things that were less valuable, that after they work on them, they have more value. Do you understand that? 
but not so with money. With money, you got a dollar bill? With money, somebody give me a dollar bill. With money, somebody give me a $20 bill. Somebody give me, here's a 20, I just need one. I got a 20, give me something else. What you got? A one, all right? Did anybody notice that these two pieces of paper are the same size? Do you notice that they have the same amount of ink on them? Do you notice that they're made out of the same virtually worthless stuff? It's paper. Did you get it? It's paper. When we create money, we have created an instrument of value that has no value of its own. And it's just as expensive or inexpensive to print the 20 as it is to print the 1. I'm here to prove to you that bankers, especially in the Federal Reserve System, make multiplied trillions of dollars and never create one thing of value. Are you with me? You want to learn this or not? Are you sure? An automaker might make 1% or 2% profit. A builder might make 10% profit. But the printers of money have no limit to the, ab ab to the amount of money they can create and the wealth that they can create for themselves. Money's the bloodline of a civilized society. It's the instrument by which a product is sold or bought. Reduce the supply of money below the necessary levels to sustain trade. Reduce the amount of this in the system below the levels necessary to sustain the current trade and you create a depression. In 1930, let me ask you a question. Did we not have farms? In 1930, did we not have factories? Did we have the greatest roadway system in the world at that time? Yes. Did we have the greatest communication system in the world at that time? Yes. Did we, did we have the greatest uh, uh, opportunity of trade with oceans on both sides and water systems like the Mississippi River running through the width and breadth of this nation? Did we have ability to move our goods and services? Yes. Did we have transportation and roadways? Yes. What did we not? Did we lack workers? Then what happened? I'll tell you what happened. The bankers decided no more money for you. They got out of the stock market. I can give you the family names. They got out of the stock market the year before. Do you know all the money that was lost in the stock market as people began to sell their stocks one after the other after the other after the other and stocks that were valued at $10,000 were selling for 15 cents? And then they had to make a run on the bank because the, the banks, the stock market had said, oh, I'll tell you what you can do. You can borrow on margin. In other words, you can buy, the economy's really good here in the late 20s. Here's what you can do. You can borrow on margin for stocks. You can buy a stock at $100 worth of stock, you can buy it for $10 and we'll lend you the other money to buy the stock and the stock is skyrocketing so you stand to make a great profit. What they didn't tell the American people and what you still don't know today is that when they did that, they also put into that legislation that they would have a 24-hour recall. In other words, however much stock you bought, it would make a lot of money, but they could call that stock in and you would be required not only to pay for the stock, but to pay for what you borrowed at interest from them. In other words, now you've got to pay the $100 that they loaned you, but they're the ones that are calling it in. So when they called it in, you didn't have the money to pay for it, so you ran to the bank. 
but the bank only keeps 20% money on, on, on hand. They loan the rest of it out, so only 20% of the people could get any of their money out of the bank. So the banks collapsed, the stock market collapsed, all at the whim of the bankers who decided they wanted to make the money. Watch me. Watch me. All that stuff was being sold. $100,000 farms were selling for $3,000. Who do you think bought them? Why are you looking at me funny? You know what you're looking at? You're looking like sheep that have been led to the slaughter and didn't know it. I'm going to continue. Can I continue? We didn't lack industrial capability. If you don't believe me, I just told you what started the Great Depression. Let me tell you what ended it. World War II. And all of a sudden, the same banks that said, no money for farms, no money for food, put people in soup lines, no money for commerce, no money for railroads, no money for roads, no money, no money. All of a sudden said, war? And all of a sudden, factories that were closed down began to work three shifts. Where'd the money come from? The same pockets that refused to give it before. Because they decide when it will be printed, how much will be printed, and how much usury or interest will be paid. Not the federal government. The federal government has no say in it, as I will prove to you. Say, debt, debt. is a devil. Yeah. By the simple manipulation of a few wealthy bankers, World War II ended the Great Depression. After successive failures convinced the public of the need of a central bank by wars, these same European bankers financed both sides of the Civil War in this country. You don't even know that. Same bankers, same families, financed both sides of the Civil War. Why? They make the money. After they couldn't get the American people to swallow the lie of a central bank by creating war, they decided they would artificially create, listen to me, recessions, depressions, inflations, and panics. Since only a small amount of deposits are stored at the bank, about 20%, the other 80% is out on loan with security of property and your promise to pay it back. A simple rumor of a bank's insolvency would make a run on that bank. Everybody would get nervous, go pull their money out of the bank, and that bank would collapse. And then the international bankers who started the rumor in the first place would look like profits. P-R-O-P-H-E-T-S, profit. Are you hearing something you've never known? Wave your hand. If you think America ought to know, wave your other hand. All right, then don't quit on me. One of the key movers and shakers of this uh, let's get a central bank by making the people afraid by causing their banks to collapse one of the key movers and shakers was a man by the name of, you might recognize it, J.P. Morgan. His father was an agent for the wealthy, you might know this name, Rothschild family. Here's a quote. The Federal Reserve. In 1869, J.P. Morgan went to London and reached an agreement for a company known as the Southern Northern Securities that was intended to act as the international bank, as, as the agent for the Rothschild Company in the United States. The first major panic created by the international bankers occurred in 1893 when local bankers from around the nation were told to call in all their loans. Told by who? By these wealthy bankers. Senator Robert Owen testified before a congressional committee that the call on the banks, watch, 
testified before a congressional committee that the bank he owned, this was a senator, received from the National Bankers Association what came to be known as the Panic Circular of 1893. It stated, you will at once retire one-third of your circulation and call in one-half of all your loans. Why? Because that makes the bank collapse. Why do they want to create a panic to make these banks collapse? Because these banks are under their control. They're the ones that called in the loans. Therefore, they wanted a central bank. They wanted one place to control the money and the wealth of this nation and its people as well. And they couldn't get it. So they created these panics. Listen to this. A representative of the Rothschild interests, J.P. Morgan, was preparing for the next scheduled event in the creation of America's Central Bank. During the early months of 1907, Morgan was in Europe for five months, shuttling back and forth between London and Paris, the homes of the two branches of the Rothschild banking family. The reason Morgan was in Europe was a decision was being made to have Morgan participate a, or precipitate a bank panic in America. When he returned, he started rumors that the Knickerbocker Bank in New York was insolvent. The bank's depositors became frightened because they thought that Morgan, being the best known banker of the day, might very well be right. Their panic started a run on the bank. Morgan was right. And the panic at Knickerbocker also caused runs on other banks, and the panic of 1907 was complete. The propaganda started almost immediately that the state chartered bankers could not be trusted anymore with the banking affairs of the nation. The need for a central bank became apparent by the panic of 1907, or at least this is how the conspiracy argued. Historian Frederick Lewis Allen, writing in Life magazine, became aware of the plot. He wrote, certain chroniclers have arrived at the ingenious conclusion that the Morgan interests took advantage of the unsettled conditions during the autumn of 1907 to precipitate the panic, guiding it shrewdly as it progressed so that it would kill off rival banks and consolidate the pre eminence of the banks within the J.P. Morgan orbit. Woodrow Wilson, who was president of Princeton University in 1907, spoke to the American people attempting to remove whatever blame might be placed upon the Morgan shoulders. He said, all this trouble could be averted. Now listen to this. All this trouble could be averted if we would appoint a committee or, of six or seven public spirited minds like J.P. Morgan to handle the affairs of the money of our nation. So Wilson wanted to hand over the affairs of the nation to the very person who had caused the panic in the first place, J.P. Morgan and six or seven of his associates. Are you learning anything? Okay, I, 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 let me hurry. The individual bankers, the solution, of course, a central bank. The individual the bankers used to introduce the legislation that created the central bank was a senator from Rhode Island and maternal grandfather of the Rockefeller brothers, David Nelson et al., by the name of Nelson Aldrich. He was appointed to a national monetary committee and charged to make a thorough study of the financial practices before formulating bank and, current and, and reform legislation. For two years, the commission toured the banking houses of Europe, learning the secrets of central banking system in Europe. Upon Aldrich's return in November of 1910, he boarded a train to Hoboken, New Jersey, for a ride to Jekyll Island, Georgia. His destination was the Jekyll Island Hunt Club, which was owned by J.P. Morgan. It was here that the legislation that would give America its central bank was written. Aboard the train with Senator Aldrich and later joining them in Georgia were A. Pyatt Andrew, the Assistant Secretary of the Treasury, Senator Nelson Aldrich, the National Monetary Commission, Frank Vanderlip, President of Kuhn and Loeb's National City Bank of New York, Henry Davidson Sr., partner of the J.P. Morgan, Charles Norton, President of J.P. Morgan's First National Bank of New York, Paul Arberg, partner in the banking house of Kuhn, Loeb and Company, and Benjamin Strong, President of J.P. Morgan's Bankers Trust Company. The railroad car that these gentlemen traveled in belonged to Senator Ulrich, and while they were aboard, they were sworn to secrecy and asked to refer to each other by first names only. Uh, one, of the first, one of those, Mr. Vanderlip, later went on to reveal his role in writing the bill that created the Federal Reserve System. He wrote in the Saturday Evening Post, 
In 1910, I was as, as secretive, indeed, as, as secretive as any conspirator. I do not feel it is any exaggeration to speak of our secret expedition to Jekyll Island as the occasion of the actual conception of what eventually became the Federal Reserve System. We were told to leave our last names behind us. We were told further that we should avoid dining together in the night departure. We were instructed to come one at a time un unobtrusively as possible to the terminal of the New Jersey literal on the Hudson where Senator Aldrich's private car would be in readiness attached to the rear end of the train for the south. Once aboard the private car we began to observe the taboo that had been fixed on last names. Discovery we knew simply must not happen or else all the time and effort would be wasted. Notice that the conspirators did not want the American people to know what they had in store for them. A central bank. The legislation was to to be written not by a group of legislators, but a group of bankers, mostly connected with the man responsible for 1907's panic, J.P. Morgan. The conspiracy also had one additional problem. They had to avoid the name Central Bank. And for that reason, they had come up with the designation of the Federal Reserve System. It would be owned by private individuals who would draw profit from the ownership of shares and who would control the nation's issuance of money. It would have as its command the nation's entire financial resources and it would be able to mobilize and mortgage the United States by involving the United States in major wars. The method the conspirators used to defraud the American people was to divide the Federal Reserve System into 12 districts so that the American people could not call the bank a central bank. The fact that the 12 districts had one d director called the Federal Reserve Chairman, apparently was not to be considered relevant. The one non-banker at Jekyll Island was Senator Nelson Aldrich, but he certainly could have qualified as a wealthy man, capable of starting his own bank. When he entered the Senate in 1881, he was worth $50,000. When he left in 1911, he was worth $30 million. Now that the legislation creating the central bank was written, it would need a president who would not veto the bill after it passed the House and Senate, the president in 1910 and 11, you ought to know him in Ohio, was William Howard Taft, a Republican elected in 1908. And he was on record as saying he would veto a bill that would come to his desk concerning a central bank. He was a Republican and was surely to be erected, elected to a second term in 1912. So William Howard Taft was the president, but he wouldn't go along with the scheme. So in the Republican primary, Teddy Roosevelt, anybody remember him? Teddy Roosevelt ran against Taft in the Republican primary. He was backed by this group of bankers, but he lost in the Republican primary. Listen to this. So they decided they'd have to do something about the regular election. So what did they do? They went and got Teddy Roosevelt, a Republican, to enter the presidential race against Taft, a Republican, so that the Democratic candidate, Woodrow Wilson, who had pledged he would sign the bill, the Republicans would divide their vote. And therefore, Woodrow Wilson would be elected with less than a majority vote. Couldn't beat Taft on his own. So then they financed Teddy Roosevelt, a Republican, to run two Republicans in the presidential election, dividing the Republican vote. It's not about Republican or Democrat. I'm simply telling you how these people are able to manipulate the system. So their millions back a candidate, knowing that he's not going to be elected, so that their man can get elected because he will pass the legislation to the central bank. He was elected by less than a majority vote, and the Federal Reserve System came into being. Hello? Watch this. Here's how it works. They print it, we borrow it, and we pay them interest. This is a private company, privately held. They cannot get, they have to pay for postage stamps. They are that far away from the federal government. This is an independent corporation 
and group of bankers. So when you hear the news say, the Fed decided that the interest rate will go up, how do, how do they get to decide? They get to decide because in 1913, Woodrow Wilson, he was elected, he was inaugurated in January of 1913. In December of 1913, he signed the Federal Reserve Act, bringing the Federal Reserve system into place in America and did what Thomas Jefferson said must never happen. He took the control of the money away from the people by taking it away from the Congress and gave it to a group of private individuals who have to pay taxes on the money they loan the government. Here's how it works. Here's how it works. Let's say the government, which always needs money because it always spends more than it is able to collect in taxes. So the federal government needs a billion dollars. Since they gave away their ability to create the money, they have to go to the creators. The creators of the money according to the legislation passed in 1913. Incidentally, the Federal Reserve Board has been in operation in this country since 1913. They have never been audited one time. Do you see that we've been taken captive? That's all I'm trying to... My whole point, somebody asked me, Pastor, why are you sharing that? My whole point is to let you know you're in bondage and don't know it. You're serving two masters and you don't know it. They are using you and you don't know it. So since they, the, the government needs a billion dollars, since they can't create the money because in 1913 they gave that responsibility and they gave that authority to the Federal Reserve, they have to go to, our government has to go to the Federal Reserve and ask them for the billion dollars. Well, since the Federal Reserve is a private corporation, they're not about ready to just give their money away. So they say to the government, we will loan you the billion dollars for your agreement to pay it back with interest. But now wait a minute. The government doesn't have the ability to create the money. The Federal Reserve creates the money. So the Federal Reserve, through legislation in Congress, not that they control it, but for the actual printing of the money, that's the only thing we have the ability to do, Congress tells the Treasury Department, the Fed will loan us a billion dollars, print a billion dollars in U.S. Treasury bonds. So for a thousand dollars, they print a billion dollars of bills, of bonds. Those bonds are given to the Federal Reserve, a billion dollars. Now the Federal Reserve in bonds plus interest. The Federal Reserve then gives the bonds to the government to pay its bills. But watch me, because you're not thinking. The government needed a billion dollars. They borrowed a billion dollars. But the Federal Reserve said, we'll loan you the billion dollars plus interest but it only prints the billion dollars. So the interest payments are never created and put into the system. So how is the government ever going to pay them back? They didn't have the billion dollars to begin with. If they didn't have the billion, then they didn't have the billion plus interest. So they get given the billion, but they can't pay the interest because the interest money was never created and put in the system. That's how it's growing a billion, six million dollars a day. We can't pay the interest. The money is not in the system. But what about you? Oh, it gets worse than that. It gets worse than that. Let's take that billion dollars. Legislation has been created that the Federal Reserve, having that one billion dollars of treasury bonds sitting in its belly at interest, can lend 
as a result of having that one billion, they can lend 15 billion. Wait, paper money, credit. No, no, there's no substance, there's nothing backing it, but they can come to you and say, we will loan you 15 billion on credit because we have one billion that we created and had the government give back to us now we can loan 15 billion that 15 billion plus the one is 16 billion dollars in that one transaction of which there are thousands that one trans transaction where they've got 16 billion dollars out there that people are paying them in interest that in reality the money doesn't even exist but what does exist is your money that they take and 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 we wonder why bankruptcies were more in the first three months of 2003 than in the history of this country is there a reason for that yes it's called credit it's called debt how many of you agree that's awful and that shouldn't be they shouldn't be able to you know put in a billion dollars and take out the billion plus the interest money because more is being taken out of the system than's put in the system keeping the people enslaved to the tune of seven trillion dollars in national debt alone that doesn't include state debt that doesn't include municipality debt. It doesn't include personal debt. That's just the federal debt. That's just what we borrowed from the Federal Reserve that we can't pay back. Are, are you ready? How many of you agree that's awful? Okay, what about you? Let's see. You can never get out of debt in a usury system with a built-in shortage of money. Did you hear me? Now watch. Uh, let's say you're going to buy a house. Let's say that house is $150,000. And let's say current rate today is 7%. You do understand that by the end of that 30-year mortgage, you will have paid for a $150,000 house $360,000. You, you do understand that. So let me ask you a question. You bought a house for $150,000. Why did you buy it for $150,000? Watch me, because that's what it was worth. Why didn't you pay $360,000 for your house? Because your house is not worth $360,000. So let me ask you a question. Why are you paying $200,000 more for your $150,000 house than it's worth? Because you're caught in a system that tells you you have to because you don't see any way out and the world if you were of the world would love you but you are not of this world and they hate you they use you now let me ask you a question you got a house 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 all these houses you drive up and down the road they're building them everywhere houses 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 every one of them is in this situation now, when you go to buy your $150,000 house, say you're going to build a $150,000 house, the bank will either credit your account, because they don't have the money on reserve anyway, they will credit your account $150,000, is that right? And then you'll write checks out of that $150,000 to pay the builder, to pay the lights, to pay for the whatever, right? Okay, now let me ask you a question. So $150,000 got created and put in the system, right? Where's the other $200,000 coming from? So you yelled and screamed when you saw the federal government doing it, but you do it every day. You're putting in $150,000 and you're taking out $360,000. Where do you think it's coming from? It has to come from increased wages, which then put pressure on whoever you work for to raise the price of their goods and since they can't do that they've got to go borrow money and so they borrow money and now the bankers are making more money do you understand do you understand do you really do you understand so you buy a $25,000 car but it costs you 32,000 
If you have a $25,000 car, would you walk out today and pay somebody $32,000 for it? But that's what you're doing. God, I want to just, I just want to shake people. Why do you not understand that that's what you're doing? And do you understand that what happens then is people get pitted against people because we're all scratching for money. Because we got money put in the system, but we didn't get enough money put in the system because nobody ever puts the interest money in the system. And yet we keep continuing to pay interest, but we never got the money for the interest, so we got to find a way to get it. And so we rob God. And so we rob our children. And so we rob our futures. So that we can participate in a system we're not supposed to be in to begin with. Now let me tell you something. Let me tell you something. You are not going to be able tomorrow. I've got, I've got 15 more pages of this. But I understand you've had about all you can take. You, I understand you can't go out tomorrow and pay cash for your house. I understand that. But I'm a little bit tired of people shouting, Hallelujah, the bank approved me for a loan. They approved to use you. How must they feel to sit back and say, Okay, I got this thing. I got this thing worth $150,000 and they paid me $360,000 for it. I got a $25,000 automobile, they're going to pay me $32,000 for it. With money that was never created. It was never put in the system. Now let me tell you something. And I admonish you. I admonish you in the Lord. I'm not, re I'm not rebuking you. I'm just, all I'm trying to do, don't get mad at me. I'm just trying to show you where we are. I'm trying to show you the system we're involved in. Do you know that the average citizen in this country gets solicited for eight credit cards a year who have been bankrupt and have the lowest credit rating available? They don't care because they give you the card. You go out and buy the thing. You can't, you can't pay for it anyway, so they get to repossess it and sell it again. We're on the wrong side of this equation. It's time that the wealth of the sinner got transferred over in the hands of the just. Now, how many of you learned something today you didn't know? How many of you are going to use it? How many of you are going to use that in your life? Don't you dare go buy a, a suit of clothes and put it on a credit card and pay 12% interest on it. My God Almighty, you're going you're gonna to buy a suit for $125 and pay $300 for it. Stop it. Stop it. Wherever you are, stop. A woman came to me and she said, Pastor, I've been divorced three times. What should I do? I said, stop. She said, what does God want me to do? I said, God wants you to stop. Wherever you are right now, you know, we used to play that game where you run around called freeze tag. Free. Just freeze, man. Wherever you are, freeze. Freeze. Drive your car till you can pay your car off. Stop where you are. Yes, yes, young person, hear me, hear me. Did you ever notice, let me give you this one little tidbit. I'll, I'll let you go here in about two seconds, minutes. <laughs> I just pulled out two newspaper articles. You know, we're in a recession, right? You know, money's tight, right? Right? Okay, okay. Then how come this, I, I pulled these right out of the newspaper. Valley Bank this year posted a 49% gain in profits. 
Same page, right below it, another bank. Profits rise 21% in three months. Because the minute you start feeling the least bit better about the economy, out you go to borrow. And right in the middle of recession, right in the middle of bad times, they're not suffering. But you are. And you know why? Because we're greedy. We've got to keep up with the Joneses. Our car's got a scratch on it, and it don't have 20s. Hello? Don't you see this system pits us against each other? It makes us war with each other. It causes divorce. Greatest single cause of divorce, secular psychiatrists, sociologists will tell you. Number one cause of divorce in America, lack of money. In the wealthiest nation on earth. In the wealthiest nation on earth. Why? Because we are built on a system of debt. I'd like to tell you how they manipulate the stock market. Haven't you ever noticed that the stock market goes up and down by whatever Director Greenspan says? Alan Greenspan can go on TV, make one two-sentence statement, and walk away, and the stock market will go straight up. He can go out and make one statement. You do understand who he is. He's the chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. He's the only one you ever get to see. And they make all that interest. They make all that money. And we go further and further and further and further and further and further in debt. If it's not working, look around here today. If you would only see your faces when I say God wants you out of debt, you look at me as if I just told you you were supposed to grow a third arm. Seriously. Because, because you're so ingrained in that system. Well, that's just the way you do it. But that paradigm has to change. We're going to finance the gospel, not the European banking system. Hallelujah. So start today. Start wherever you are. Sow your way out. Believe God. Be disciplined. Watch this. Everybody go. Everybody go like this. Watch. And I'm going to let you go. Go just like this. Go. Put your tongue up on the roof of your mouth like this. Up there. Right there at the front of your teeth. No. Bankers produce no usable product of any wealth, yet their usury robbery almost doubles their net assets every 10 years. Is it possible another generation under their system will make them legal owners of the entire United States and 200, how, how many million citizens we got now? Anyway bond slaves on the continent our fathers colonized and developed. Well, that's six pages. Hallelujah. You get something worth coming for this morning?